Good afternoon and welcome to the UNC Cancer Network's telehealth lecture series. Today we have a lecture on acute myeloid leukemia, an overview and updates with Matthew Foster, MD. We're glad to have you here today. Uh, if you are having any trouble at all with the lecture, you can email us at unccn at unc.edu. You may call or text us at 919-445-1000. That number works for calls, works for texts. That will get through to our team. Uh, we have poll everywhere, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. You can find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, find us on YouTube, lots of places to find out more, and at our website, unccn at unc.edu, or excuse me, unc, www.unccn.org is uh, probably one of the best places to get information about our lecture series. All right, a uh, quick poll to start you off. In relation to, um, to acute myeloid leukemia, subchromosomal molecular genetic findings are increasingly guiding prognostic discussions and therapeutic decisions. Uh, that's a mouthful, but... Uh, True or false? And this is a good way to start us off and to go ahead and get you connected to our Poll Everywhere tool. Uh, you can do that by just going to pollab.com forward slash UNCCN and you can answer the question there through the web. Or easier yet, if you have a, a smartphone, you can go ahead and connect by dialing 22333 or excuse me, texting 22333 and then putting in the letters UNCCN. You only need to do that one time. That connects you to Poll Everywhere. Then you can answer A for true, B for false, and then you'll be set to uh, do the Q&A at the end of the lecture as well. All right, we'll take a look at that in a minute. Uh, we will be reading a disclosure statement for this lecture and future lectures. This activity is planned and implemented under the sole supervision of Thomas Shea, MD, the course director in association with the Office of Continuing Professional Development, UNC CPD. Thomas Shea, MD, consults for Spectrum Pharma and receives research support from Millennium, Atsuka, GSK, BMS, Novartis, and Seattle Genetics. CPD staff have no financial relationships with commercial interests. The speaker, Matthew Foster, MD, receives research support from Celator, Celgene, and Macrogenetics. During this presentation, the speaker will discuss off-label use of mitostorin for acute myeloid leukemia, discuss off-label use of CPX351 for acute myeloid leukemia. Dr. Foster has received research funding from Celator, a manufacturer of CPX351. Discuss off-label use of AG221 for acute myeloid leukemia, and Dr. Uh, and Dr. Foster has received research funding from Celgene, which holds development and commercialization rights to AG221. All right. Dr. Foster is a clinical assistant professor with the, UN, with the School of Medicine at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He also serves as a leader of the inpatient service line at the NC Cancer Hospital and director of, leukemia pro, of the leukemia program. Dr. Foster works with clinical trials and translational research in acute myeloid leukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and uh, myeloid and myeloidy plastic syndromes. And we'll go to our poll. And welcome, Dr. Foster. Right. Thank you so much Thank for being you, here. Uh, maybe you can uh, take just a moment while we're waiting for those poll results to tell us uh, what led you to, to your interest in oncology and, and uh, specifically uh, acute myeloid leukemia. Well, I think uh, initially the interest in oncology stemmed mm -hmm. from the experience with patients in my uh, intern year of residency where I just um, actually felt like a good fit for me and, mm -hmm. and nothing more than that. Um, with acute myeloid leukemia and other leukemias, um, two things. I think fundamentally I'm a, a visual person and, and I've included some visuals from pathology slides uh, here in the talk. Um, and it, it's, um, it's rewarding to be able to make a diagnosis by rapidly looking at peripheral blood or a bone marrow sample and then see imme pretty immediate results from therapies that you're giving to patients. Um, additionally, the subject of the talk is um, uh, leukemia genetics. Mm -hmm. And we've known for a long time a lot about leukemia genetics um, because the cells are so easy to procure. They can be taken out of the peripheral blood and uh, studied in the lab. And that hasn't always been the case for other cancer types. And sure. So we know a lot more about genetics uh, for a lot longer in AML, um, mm -hmm. and we're 
we're rapidly catching up in many other um, cancer subtypes, and, and that's kind of one of the, the aspects of this disease that led me to, to do what I do today. So. Great. Well, we're very glad that you do. I've had an opportunity to preview the slides. They look great. And uh, so let's take a look at this poll. Looks like uh, we've got 100. Uh, we're polling at 100 percent true. How did they do? Excellent. Good. Plus. Good. All right. Uh, so with that, I will turn this over to you and give you the keyboard and mouse, and uh, we'll let you get started. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thanks for having me here today, and um, uh, greetings to folks um, across the state and across the street where I was just about five or ten minutes ago, and I see, I can see some of you there, so uh, so no acting up. Uh, I can see you on the screen. So. Um, uh, and thanks for having me to talk about updates in, in AML. Um, specifically, what I wanted to talk about today is updates in, as they relate to the power of genetics of leukemia cells in helping us take care of patients. Uh, so an overview uh, of the, the goals of the talk, we're going to bring everyone up to speed by talking about an overview of the clinical presentation of AML and its epidemiology, uh, then move on to uh, the way we've used genetics for many, many years in AML as a prognostic tool, moving quickly on to uh, how we can predict responses to therapies, uh, standard therapies, and then on to how we can select novel or investigational and hopefully soon to be approved therapies uh, for patients with AML. So first off, clinical presentation and epidemiology. Um, so for um, a long time, when all we had were microscopes to look at leukemia cells, um, we oversimplified what this diagnosis is. So it, it only has one name and three letters, acute myeloid leukemia. Uh, and the cells very frequently look uh, similar to one another, no matter what the genetics of the disease are. Uh, but as we've understood that patients have very disparate outcomes with this disease and the, the genetics are very heterogeneous, um, it's um, come to be understood as really a group of neoplasms that share some common features. And the common features are really myeloblasts or myeloid blasts. These are clonal immature cells that have limited capacity to differentiate into more mature hematopoietic elements. Um, clonality is a, the key in the definition of myeloblasts. And, and um, so how do we determine that we have a clone or a neoplasm rather than um, a reactive proliferation of blasts, which can occasionally be the case. So well, probably the simplest way to do it is you can infer clonality from very high blast counts. So if someone has uh, 70, 80, 90 percent of cells that look exactly the same, uh, that is probably a clonal cancer. Um, uh, another way to infer is by doing uh, immunophenotypes. So uh, each cell in the development, in the um, myeloid development, has certain markers on it that, that demonstrate that it's A, uh, a myeloid cell, and B, it's different phase of development. So myeloblasts normally have uh, CD34, CD117, 33, HLA-DR, and, and an enzyme called myeloperoxidase, which specifies that this, the cell is a myeloid lineage. Now, this is, this is normal. We all have you know, somewhere south of 5% blasts in our bone marrow, but what would not be normal would be if you saw some of these markers on the surface of the cell, along with markers uh, that should be on lymphoid cells like CD7 and CD38, or these markers here, which are markers of monocytic lineage. So if you've got something from this column and something from the, this column, uh, this is a mismatch, and it tells you that you've got uh, a cancer. Um, probably the most direct way to tell if something, if a uh, myeloblast population is clonal is to find characteristic genetic findings. That is a, a, a genetic thumbprint that this is a malignancy. How does uh, AML present itself in the, in the clinic, uh, all too often in the ER as well? Um, the, the final, uh, the common pathway um, uh, and pre presenting symptoms are usually those of bone marrow failure um, with anemia and, and related symptoms like fatigue or low red blood cell mass. Um, thrombocytopenia and bleeding complications and fever and infection. Now this comes from the fact that the myeloblasts are typically very proliferative and can um, uh, supplant the ability of the normal bone marrow cells to uh, result in normal hematopoiesis. Uh, but what's less commonly known is that uh, leukemia can infiltrate virtually any organ. Uh, can present as uh, skin involvement, um, monocytic subtypes, so monocytes uh, 
and normal situations infiltrate tissues and turn into mac tissue macrophages. And in the case of malignant monocytes, they, they do so uh, ro too robustly and can infiltrate the gums, uh, can infiltrate uh, uh, the brain or other visceral organs and, and result in organ dysfunction. One of the most feared complications of, of leukemia in its initial presentation is the height of the white blood cell count, and this can be true in very proliferative cases of AML. Uh, sometimes these terms can be used interchangeably, but that's probably not the best use of the term. So hyperleukocytosis simply refers to a high white blood cell count, and, and usually we define that as anywhere over 50,000. Uh, leukostasis typically happens in people with hyperleukocytosis, um, but really implies physiologic changes, as would be seen in the patient from the slide here where you see that there's a vessel here and there are, there's a clogging of the vessel with uh, malignant myeloblasts. The physiologic changes that can occur are ischemia in the cardiac or CNS vascular bed, so this can mimic heart attack or stroke, uh, ischemia, ocular ischemia causing visual changes, priapism and pulmonary microinfarcts that can even look like uh, pneumonia or, or infiltrates. Another feared complication is that of bleeding uh, disseminated intravascular coagulation or coagulopathy uh, can occur with any type of AML, uh, but is most frequently seen in APL where you have uh, cell surface uh, tissue factor and cancer pro pro coagulant that activate the clotting cascade, uh, and you can have annexin 2 on the surface of promyelocytes that increases fibro fibrinolysis. Um, uh, this is a, a slide from a case of APL where you see that these cells look a little bit different than the ones I showed you in a couple of slides ago. They have a lot of dense granules. They're very dark, and they have some, some uh, hour rods, which is a pathologic feature of AML. Um, if we have patients with AML that are presenting with DIC, uh, we teach uh, our fellows and others to urgently treat with uh, all transretinoic acid or ATRA, uh, which is a treatment that can, can start the cells on a path of differentiation uh, and begin to reverse the coagulopathy. But untreated, there are very high rates of, of life-threatening hemorrhage in APL. Other immediate complications that can be a challenge in the urgent setting are tumor lysis syndrome. So this can result in hyperkalemia, hyperphosphatemia, hyperuricemia. Uh, this is actually not as prevalent as in uh, some other hematologic malignancies, such as aggressive lymphomas or acute lymphoblastic leukemia. But in, in certain very proliferative cases of AML where the lactate dehydrogenase is high, the white blood cells are high, creatinine is already, the renal function is already impaired, or someone has a high pretreatment uric acid, the risk of tumor lysis can be as high as 40%. Uh, so tumor lysis can cause hyperkalemia, Hypokalemia is a unique um, complication that can occur in certain subsets of monocytic leukemia. Uh, this M4 with abnormal eosinophil AML uh, causes some renal tubular injury and can cause uh, hypokalemia as a consequence. So who gets AML and what happens to them? Um, so this is a, a little bit of a busy slide, but there's a lot of data packed in here. This is data from... Uh, several registries from the United States SEER registry and from Sweden and the UK. Uh, the curve here at the upper right, excuse me, the upper left, shows um, age-specific incidence of AML. So you've got um, incidence on the y-axis and age on the x-axis. And so fortunately, AML is very rarely seen in younger adults, and it truly is a disease of aging, peaking uh, in these series in the 6th, 7th, and 8th decades of life with a slight male predominance. Uh, so uh, looking across the age groups, what is the prognosis in these different age groups? And, and uh, this is a survival curve uh, from the same series. And so this is for patients under age of 30. And so fortunately, uh, many of these patients can be cured of their leukemia. Um, whereas that's definitely not the true as the decades advance. So older, older adults are very rarely cured of their leukemia. Um, so why is this? So these is the curve at the bottom here um, is expected survival from AML. 
um, with the sur percent surviving on the, uh, the y-axis, age on the x-axis with advancing age as you advance along the axis. And each curve represents uh, a cohort of patients treated in a specific uh, decade. So to simplify, the blue curve is, are those treated in the 1970s, red in the 1980s, green in the 90s, and uh, early 2000s in the purple curve. And what, uh, what is apparent here is that you see that survival has dramatically increased for younger patients, but not so much for older patients as the decades uh, uh, have gone on. And this is largely due to a couple of factors. One is that our supportive care for AML patients has improved in, with uh, more antibiotics and trans better transfusion practices, but more fundamentally the, the application of stem cell transplant, uh, which can be done safely in younger patients, and, uh, but not when uh, patient, most patients get above 70 years of age. So uh, this is one reason that uh, prognosis has not improved in that age group. Um, uh, another reason for that that we'll get to later is that there haven't been really any drugs approved. Um, and if, uh, the, if older patients can't tolerate transplant, there really is a need for new drugs for that population. How do we classify this disease? If I said it's a group of diseases, uh, we have to have some descriptors. This is the older um, classification system called FAB or French American British. Um, it basically says, asks what do cells look like? What do they express on their cell surface? And you have different classifications, myeloid, um, mono, myelomonocytic, monocytic, erythroid, and megakaryocytic. So the, the numbers going from M0 on up typically mean that the cells are the, reflects the stage of differentiation for, of the myeloblast. So M0 is very minimally differentiated disease uh, going up to M3, which are promyelocytic leukemias. The uh, overlapping phenotype of myelo, some myeloid antigen and some monocytic features uh, is M4, purely monocytic M5, and some, some rarer categories uh, looking at erythroid differentiation and megakaryocytic differentiation, uh, M6 and M7. Uh, what is more commonly used today is the World Health Organization classification. It recently was updated. Um, the biggest classification and that, that we're adding sub, subcategories all the time, which is really the subject of this talk, is AML with recurrent genetic abnormalities. And these are prognostically re relevant abnormalities that can confer either a favorable or unfavorable prognosis. A couple of other important categories are AML with myelodysplasia-related changes. Uh, these can be um, patients who, with a previous history of myelodysplastic syndrome, patients whose cells look very dysplastic under the microscope, or cells with characteristic genetic changes in the chromosomes that uh, would uh, imply that, this, that the leukemia developed from MDS. Um, Moving down the list, we have therapy-related myeloid neoplasms, and unfortunately, many of our uh, solid tumor and lymphoma patients and myeloma patients are exposed to DNA damaging chemotherapy and radiation, and, and therapy-related myeloid neoplasms can be a downstream consequence, uh, albeit a rare consequence of those treatments, um, also conferring a poor prognosis. Um, this not otherwise specified category, if you can't lump the, the leukemia into one of these categories, it, it fits in this grab bag. And that's where you get some of these descriptors uh, that reflect the FAB classification. What do the cells look like and what do they express on the cell surface? Uh, the ones at the end of the list here are some rarer diagnoses that, that, are, that uh, are best categorized along with AML, but are, are probably not the subject of our talk today. Um, so we've described AML, and we've alluded to the WHO classification uh, that uh, increasingly we're classifying this disease using genetics. And so why is that the case? So for many years, we've used genetics as a prognostic tool. Um, the first question that we often ask in the clinic is, we have someone with AML, what are the cytogenetics? And so... Um, you see here a pioneer in cytogenetics. This is Dr. Janet Rowley. She was at the University of Chicago. And what she's holding up here really is a good demonstration of what a cytogeneticist does. So they take the dividing cells, um, freeze them in metaphase, which, which causes the chromosomes to um, coalesce, um, and then apply a dye that gives a characteristic banding pattern. Um, 
uh, it goes without saying that this this could be this looks like chaos here. And then she has taken this and lined up each of the 23 pairs of chromosomes side by side, and in order uh, based on pattern recognition. So how do we um, how do the cytogeneticists do this in the lab? So this is a case from a patient with APL, which has a uh, recurrent translocation between the 15th and 17th chromosomes. Um, and so um, I couldn't see this myself, um, but luckily someone's added some arrows there. So there's an unusual 15th chromosome here and an unusual 17th chromosome. And so hopefully this picture outlines why this is very labor intensive and dependent on expert interpreters to, uh, to do this. And so even, even very fluid interpreters, they can only count 10 to 20 cells per case. So this limits the applicability and the sensitivity of doing cytogenetics or routine karyotype. Now, if you know what you're looking for, say if you've got a case of uh, suspected APL and you want to ask if the 15-17 translocation is present, you can do fluorescence, fluorescence in situ hybridization. Uh, and the example here shows how this is more easily interpretable. You have a red chromosome here. Uh, a, a fluorescent probe has been applied to the cell. Um, so let's say for the sake of argument, this is the 15th chromosome. This is the 17th chromosome. And so you've got one normal copy red, one normal copy green. And when they overlap, you get a yellow fluorescence signal. And so this not only takes some of the expert, the need for an expert interpreter out of it, but it also can look at hundreds of cells rather than maybe a couple of dozen and drastically increases the sensitivity of the genetic testing in this case. So when Dr. Rowley and others had uh, described the chromosomal changes in AML, uh, it was up to the clinicians and, and um, uh, patients treated in large clinical trials to, de to discern whether these were prognostically relevant. So this is a, um, an older series of patients in the United Kingdom at the Medical Research Council, uh, younger patients treated and grouped according to their cytogenetic profile. Uh, so you have a favorable group here that includes APL and patients with translocations of 821 and inversion 16. These are groups that are called core binding factor translocations because of a um, because of transcription factors that are involved in the translocations. And you can see that most, the vast majority of these patients enter complete remission, uh, and uh, over half of them survive five years or longer. On the other end of the spectrum, you have patients who have complex karyotypes, which mean um, multiple unrelated karyotypes, monosomy, so deletions of specific entire chromosomes, monosomy 5, monosomy 7, or three chromosome 3Q abnormalities, that just under two-thirds enter remission with standard chemotherapy, and long-term survival is unlikely in this group. So very disparate prognosis uh, when comparing these. And then you have a group in the middle that includes those with normal chromosomes and other uh, cytogenetic abnormalities, not otherwise in these other categories. Um, as the number of patients increased, uh, the groups like the Medical Research Council were able, the council were able to uh, define prognosis for even rarer subgroups. And so if you're seeing a patient and there's a chromosomal abnormality um, that you don't recognize has probably been described and it's probably out there in, in terms of what to expect from the prognosis. Um, so this is uh, a categorization based on uh, chromosomes, which are essentially large um, clumps of genetic material. And the question always existed, you know, as, as we got to the point where we couldn't categorize these chromosomal changes anymore, um, we've got a favorable group, an adverse group, but this group in the middle, um, it, could it be made up of patients that actually do quite well, um, uh, as well as patients who don't do very well? So could this be regression to the mean? And I wouldn't be showing you this slide if, if the answer weren't yes. So um, uh, just over 10 years ago, a, a group of German investigators looked at uh, subchromosomal genetic alterations, so mutations in genes that couldn't be seen on karyotyping. These could be point mutations, uh, internal tandem dupl duplications of genes, but this takes sequencing to know um, whether these mutations exist or not um, and would not be captured in karyotyping. So, um, uh, so what you see here are, uh, is a, a survival curve from group of patients with normal karyotype leukemia uh, 
And you see that there are patients who, in fact, do quite better than, than you would expect of other normal karyotype patients. And these are patients with mutated CEPP alpha gene, um, mutant NPM1 without a concomitant FLT3 uh, or FLT3 internal tandem, du tandem duplication. Uh, so this other genotypes group, many of these were made up of patients. This group was made up of a lot of patients with FLT3 ITDs. And so this was the first signal that we could move beyond chromosomes in terms of defining prognosis for patients. Uh, in the years that followed, many groups started uh, better defining the entire mutational landscape of, of AML. And there was something called the Cancer Genome Atlas, uh, which looked at multiple different uh, tumor types, including AML. Uh, and actually, the, even though this looks quite complicated, the mutational landscape of AML is actually more simple uh, than many other cancers. Um, to orient you to the slide, you know, overall here you see individual mutations and the frequency of those mutations. So the most frequent are FLT3 and PM1 and DNMT3A. Um, this is called a circus plot. The distance that a particular mutation and its color occupy around the circumference indicates the frequency of that mutation. Um, and then the, the thickness of the band that connects two mutations to one another. Um, shows how frequently two mutations occur in the same patient. So you can see that the DNMT3A mutants frequently co-occur with NPM1, uh, but what is a little bit less obvious is that you have some, some mutations that are mutually exclusive, like IDH1 and 2 mutations and TET2 mutations. Uh, so this helps describe uh, the complex mutational landscape of AML. So with the ability to, to define, the, to look into this complexity more and more, groups have looked into better prognostic stratification. And this is a slide from the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering and the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group uh, that asked the question, could our classic cytogenetic classification here, looking at favorable, intermediate, and unfavorable, uh, be improved upon by use of mutations, um, mutational profiling? And what they found was that for patients with favorable outcomes by cytogenetics, no individual mutation could make them less favorable. On the other side of the coin, unfavorable patients could not be upclassified by mutations, but there was a lot of room for improvement in the middle, uh, such that we have patients who did not have FLT3 mutations, but did have NPM1 mutant or IDH mutations that actually did quite well. And, and uh, patients with these mutations uh, who do poorly, irregardless of FLT3 status. So mutant TET2, MLL, AS6L1, PHF3, uh, and DNMT3-alpha. These did, did quite poorly. Um, and on the curves here, you see they do just as poorly as people with complex or unfavorable karyotypes. So this helped us further define prognosis. Um, and uh, these prognostic uh, classifications have been uh, baked into the uh, European leukemia net uh, risk stratification, which is the most common one used in clinical trials. Um, so with thinking back to that circus plot, there are lots of mutations that co-occur with one another. And um, uh, so uh, the same group at Memorial Sloan Kettering started looking into uh, whether mul the, the occurrence of multiple gene mutations at once uh, might um, have prognostic import. Um, specifically, you know, asking the question, is a FLT3 mutation always uh, an adverse marker, or could it really depend on the mutational landscape in the particular patient? And so this is one example where um, the, the survival curves in green and purple, so the green is patients with uh, absent FLT3 mutations, and purple are those with FLT3 ITD mutations, and you can see that that in these three curves, it doesn't really matter whether you have a FLT3 mutation. And, and the, the three curves are different in that they're patients with different NPM1 and DNMT3A status. Um, in this curve, however, it does make a difference. And so these are patients with um, both NPM1 mutations, NPM, uh, DNMT3A mutations, and there's quite a difference uh, that's determined whether you have a FLT3 mutation. So patients with no FLT3 mutation but these two mutated uh, have a relatively favorable prognosis, whereas that's not the case for patients with all three mutations. Uh, furthermore, these investigators were able to uh, 
define additional families of mutations such that if any of them are present in genes that are responsible for the uh, chromatin modeling or spliceosome uh, machinery or TP53 mutations and related mutations, these are uh, uh, groups of patients that do quite poorly. So um, you can say, well, that's all great. You know, we have a lot of genetic information about a lot of patients, and we can predict the future. But really what we want to do is impact the lives of the patients and improve outcomes. So the first question is really, can we use these uh, genetic uh, descriptors of leukemia as a pr uh, predictive tool to tell whether they will respond to conventional therapies? And the answer is, uh, the short answer is yes, but how do we do this? So this is, these are some numbers from a study looking at dose intensification of donorubicin, so anthracycline dose intensification. Um, this is a study from the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group looking at the dose of donorubicin and randomizing younger patients to a dose of 45 milligrams per meter squared versus 90 milligrams per meter squared given in the context of so-called 7 plus 3 therapy. So 7 plus 3 has is, is really been the standard uh, AML induction therapy for several decades now. It's seven days of a continuous anthracycline, a continuous cytarabine plus three days of an anthracycline. And what's obvious from this uh, uh, out, outcomes from the entire study population are that the patients with the higher dose donorubicin did better, both in terms of the complete remission rate and overall survival, and this didn't come at a cost of early mortality. Um, but when you looked at subgroups, um, it turned out that uh, almost all the benefit in, uh, incurred to the um, favorable and intermediate cytogenetic risk patients, and unfavorable risk patients did not fare as well with high-dose anthracycline as, as um, did not get that benefit. Um, it, Subsequent to this publication, there has been some multivariate modeling that has suggested a very slight statistical benefit for the high-dose anthracycline in the unfavorable population. But as you can see, these curves are very similar, and I would argue that that is really not a clinically meaningful benefit in that population. So there's still an area of unmet need. Uh, additionally, the investigators also looked at the mutational profile and this is a, uh, an example of the uh, in, uh, patients in this study with NPM1 mutations, um, and which is classically associated with a favorable prognosis. However, the only group in their study that had a favorable prognosis were those with NPM1 mutations who had the high-dose anthracycline. So these are unmutated patients and patients who got the low-dose anthracycline uh, with NPM1 mutations. And they do actually pretty poorly. So, so it's important to know what the leukemia genetics are uh, when selecting the dose of anthracycline. Not only is it important to know the genetics in, um, in choosing induction therapy, but it's also important in choosing post-remission therapies. So um, in the 1990s, the uh, CALGB, or what is now Alliance, uh, published a study uh, looking at dose escalation of cytarabine during consolidation, comparing drastically different doses of infusional uh, cytarabine, 100 milligrams per meter squared, 400, and 3 grams per meter squared. And like the other studies, if you look at the entire population, there was a benefit for the patients getting high-dose anthracycline. But when you unpack the data according to cytogenetic subgroups, the core binding factor patients by far achieved the most benefit from the dose escalation, the dose intensification of, high, of cytarabine. This was less the case in normal karyotype patients and not the case at all. So all patients with high-risk leukemia did poorly despite, regardless of the dose of cytarabine that they received. So the other choice for post-remission therapy, uh, converting a remission into a, a durable remission and a cure, is allogeneic stem cell transplant. And I want to talk a little bit about a meta-analysis that was published uh, just about eight years ago. This looked at 24 trials in over 6,000 patients uh, in uh, the U.S., Europe, and Japan. These were all patients who had entered um, complete remission uh, after standard induction therapy, and each of them used what's called a biologic randomization uh, to allocate patients to allogeneic transplant with a sibling donor, um, HLA-matched sibling donor, or not. So if a patient did not have a sibling donor, they were allocated to chemotherapy, sibling donor, transplant. And this is the so-called biologic randomization, that the patients would be 
um, alike in all ways except for the fact that they had a sibling. Um, and each study reported uh, an intention to treat analysis and a subgroup analysis based on cytogenetic risk group. And the study was positive in favor of transplant. So this is, uh, this is called a forest plot. And if, if you, you've got this vertical line here, um, and if a, the box uh, representing the, the study population falls on the side of the left that favors transplant, on the right it would favor chemotherapy. And so this was a slightly positive uh, analysis in favor of transplant. Uh, but when you looked at the cytogenetic groups, it wasn't positive. It was actually equivocal when it came to the favorable risk patients. Uh, uh, not surprisingly, because some of the individual studies that went into this analysis were uh, favored transplant for four, poor risk AML. But this is the first time that intermediate risk AML in such a study was shown to have a survival benefit. So this has been a practice changing in that we now refer patients with intermediate risk uh, AML to transplant for consul a consultation for transplant, all other things being considered. So that, was, that looked at uh, cytogenetic risk groups, but what about some of these molecular risk groups? So that study that I showed you a little bit ago that, that was one of the first studies to look into the import of FLT3 and NPM1 mutations was one of these biologic randomization studies. So you had a group that, that got transplanted by virtue of having a sibling donor, and you had a group that didn't get transplants. And so they did an, a post hoc analysis of that of the question, do some of these subgroups benefit from transplant or not? And it turned out that the patients with NPM1 mutations who didn't have FLT3 mutations actually had overlapping survival curves and, and did not benefit from allotransplant. transplant, whereas patients in the other group Remember, this is mostly FLT3 mutated AML um, uh, benefited from transplant. And this also was practice changing in that we began referring patients with FLT3 mutated AML for transplant consultations after they went into remission. So in summary, for post-remission treatment uh, for AML, we tend to think that the risk of relapse is less than the risk of transplant mort related mortality in those with favorable genetics. Um, Contrast that to adverse genetics, where the risk of relapse is much higher than the risk of transplant-related mortality, and we refer these patients uh, abruptly for stem cell transplant consideration. Even if um, they don't have a sibling match, uh, we consider them for unrelated donors or alternative donors. Um, and intermediate risk patients, as I said before, we refer them for consideration of transplant, although the benefit for transplant is, is a little bit smaller than those uh, with adverse genetics. And so some of these patients end up getting um, chemotherapy consolidation as well. So we've looked at, looked at how we can predict response to conventional therapies, but what about new or, new or uh, novel therapies? Um, so one of the groups in, that F, in the WHO classification that really has unmet need are patients with AML with MDS-related changes or patients with secondary leukemias. Um, how do we know that there's, there are MDS-related changes? So this is a, a, a smear from a patient with dysplastic neutrophils and leukemia. So the neutrophils should have about five lobes to their nucleus, and here you have one with uh, really only one lobe, and here you have one with many more than five lobes. And so this is an example of a leukemia with, dis, with myelodysplasia on, um, on morphology. And you also have thinking back to the nice arrow that they've included here, a missing chromosome 7, so monosomy 7, which is a genetic hallmark of, uh, of uh, AML with MDS-related changes, so a genetically and morphologically defined subgroup. These patients typically do poorly with conventional chemotherapy, so this was an area of unmet need. Um, so in the area of targeting um, uh, drugs to specific genetic abnormalities, um, another area of investigation has also been looking at subgroups that might um, benefit from novel drug delivery mechanisms. And so this is a liposomal or nanoparticle um, encapsulation of standard chemotherapy. So this is, uh, this is the liposome here. This is a drug called CPX351, um, and it encapsulates both cytarabine and donorubicin in a specific ratio so that the company that developed this found this to be the, the drugs to be most synergistic with one another if there was a five to one ratio of cytarabine to donorubicin. And so you can see this in the liposome uh, the, the schema here. 
And it's demonstrated that it is pref the liposomes are preferentially uptake, uh, taken up into the leukemic blast um, as, as demonstrated by the fluorescence here in the nucleus. Um, so this drug um, seemed uh, in early studies had shown encouraging results with uh, inducing rem remissions as well as a relatively favorable toxicity profile that some of the gastrointestinal toxicities and other non-hematologic toxicities that we see with standard induction therapy weren't happening. And so as this seemed to be a fairly well-tolerated approach, it was investigated in older patients. Uh, the first uh, kind of randomized trial was a, actually a randomized phase two trial that was looking at did this provide a benefit in all older patients. And the answer actually was no. It was a negative trial for patients over age 60 with AML. But one subgroup seemed to benefit uh, more than others, and this is the patients with secondary AML. And this is defined as in, in this trial as patients who had received prior chemotherapy, so the therapy-related myeloid neoplasms, um, patients with prior MDS or MDS-related changes as by, by karyotype as well. Uh, and so there was a survival benefit in this subgroup of the phase two trial, and this was carried forward into a phase three trial. I'm not showing you that data here, but uh, it appears to be a positive trial, and hopefully this drug will be approved for this, this group of older patients so pay over age 60 with secondary leukemias. Uh, and hopefully that's something that's on the, uh, on the close horizon. So other drugs that we've used for a long time have been called, these drugs called DNA methyltransferase inhibitors. This is azacitidine and decitabine. So what is DNA methyltransferase? So DNA methyltransferase uh, transfers methyl groups onto promoter regions of genes. And when the gene has a methyl group on its promoter, we think that that gene is silenced. When a gene that is responsible for hematopoiesis has been silenced, that's where you get uh, bone marrow failure, you get um, myelodysplasia, and you can occasionally have uh, increased blast or leukemia. So DNA methyltransferase inhibitors operate by shutting down that enzyme and resulting in demethylation of the promoter regions and, re, and we hope re-expression of genes responsible for healthy hematopoiesis. We don't know if this is the exact mechanism by which responses happen, but we do know that in MDS, these drugs have been approved. They help, um, they improve survival, they improve quality of life and transfusion burden in those patients. And because of the overlap between AML and MDS, uh, these drugs have been used uh, frequently by physicians off-label in patients with AML that we know want, uh, want tolerate or want benefit from standard induction therapy. And so, um, but we've usually used clinical means to tell whether someone would be a good candidate for that. And, and I'm glad to say that uh, a group recently looked at this and published uh, genetic guidance about who might respond to uh, the cytobine therapy in AML. Um, so looking at the, the kind of the, the usual suspect molecular um, changes in AML, a group at, Wa at uh, Washington University in St. Louis found that uh, patients with TP53 mutations were highly likely to respond to decitabine. Now, these are patients with extremely poor prognosis, uh, but they were highly likely to respond to decitabine, whereas patients with these mutations, SRSF2 and RUNX1, were not likely to respond. And, and uh, no statistical significance were found in some other groups. Now, now, this data needs to be hashed out a little bit more before we apply it broadly to the clinical scenarios, but I think this is, hopefully in the future, we'll start to see that the use of DNA methyltransferase inhibitors can be selected based on genetic categorization. Now, what about targeting some of these specific mutations? So FLT3, what does FLT3 stand for? We looked at the prognostic importance of that mutation, um, but FLT3 stands for uh, FMS-like tyrosine kinase. And so those of you who treat CML patients are familiar with tyrosine kinase inhibitors for CML. Um, like imatinib, dasatinib, and are aware of how successful those have been. So when we found a kinase gene that was responsible for poor prognosis in AML, um, doctors, patients, and pharmaceutical companies said, that sounds great. That, will, that would be a great target. We can make a certain bad category of AML into the next CML. Well, that was about 10 years ago, and 
Uh, for those of you who interact with AML patients, no, none of these drugs are approved yet. So, so the story isn't that simple. So this is a schematic representation of what the tyrosine kinase looks like. The commonly mutated areas are this juxtamembrane domain where this tandem duplication can insert base pairs and insert um, and, and change the conformation of the protein. You can also have point mutations in one of the kinase domains as well. And um, this is a, a cartoon of what happens in a normal circumstance where you have wild type FLT3. You have downstream, you have a dimerization of two FLT3 um, molecules um, and phosphorylation of downstream proteins that uh, end up with a relatively controlled and well uh, and checked uh, proliferative signal from the, from the kinase. However, you get conformational changes in one of the dimers uh, with an ITD mutation, so this gets longer and it doesn't signal, and it signals by phosphorylating um, different adapter proteins, either in this case or the case of the point mutation. And usually this is for unchecked growth. Uh, so FLT3 inhibitors in development include uh, PKC412 or mitostorin, serafinib, or AC220, otherwise known as quizartinib. Uh, these plots here are called kinome maps, and they look like fronds of a fern, and each tip of the frond of the fern represents a specific kinase that can be inhibited by a drug. The size of the red um, balloons here indicates how potent inhibiting that specific kinase is. And so FLT3, actually on this map, sits about right here. Um, so you can see that PKC412 does hit FLT3, but it also inhibits a number of other kinases. Um, serafinib is a little bit more specific, um, and AC220 here hits FLT3 quite strongly and, and is, is more selected and specific uh, FLT3 inhibitor than these other drugs. So um, probably the most advanced in the clinical situation is uh, mitostorin, or PKC412 from the previous slide. Now this was compared um, in a study that took several years to accrue and follow up. Uh, called the Ratify study. This was um, run by the CLGB or Alliance, um, and this is the first time in many years that a, a new drug for AML has been shown to have a survival advantage in, um, in patients with FLT3 mutations. Um, now, this was only patients with FLT3 mutations, uh, and the, plus, the, uh, the patients in the blue cur curve got standard chemotherapy plus mitostorin, and in the red curve, standard chemotherapy plus a placebo. And the, the survival of the advantage held true even when you took out from the analysis or censored the patients who had received a stem cell transplant. So you could take for, uh, conclude from that that, uh, well, we should, we should treat all FLT3 patients, uh, FLT3 mutated patients with a FLT3 inhibitor. But the corollary to that is should we treat other patients with FLT3 inhibitors or tyrosine kinase inhibitors? And this is a study out of Germany that looked at what we think of as a FLT3 inhibitor, serafinib added to uh, standard chemotherapy. And it found, um, and, but this didn't only enroll FLT3 mutated patients, this enrolled all patients with FLT3, regardless of FLT3 status. And in this population, you saw benefits with regard to event free and relapse free survival, but not overall survival. So this didn't lead to the approval of serafinib for this, this case, but I think it, it shows you that kinase inhibition in AML is probably more complicated than just targeting FLT3. So moving on beyond tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, there are other genes on that list of frequently mutated genes, and one of the more frequently mutated was isocitrate dehydrogenase genes, or IDH1 and 2. So IDH2 is a mitochondrial enzyme that uh, typically catalyzes in the wild type. It catalyzes the um, conversion of isocitrate to something called alpha-ketoglutarate. When you have mutant IDH2, you, it makes something called 2-hydroxyglutarate, which, is a, um, which then goes on to be transported to the nucleus of the cell and inhibits uh, TET2. Uh, when TET2 is inhibited, uh, this blocks cellular differentiation by, by a hypermethylation. Um, and then when, a mu uh, when an inhibitor of mutant IDH2 is added, the production of 2-hydroxyglutarate drops and you get production of alpha-ketoglutarate. Um, 
Interestingly enough, so you, we talked about APL earlier in, this, in the lecture. Um, the drugs treat, that treat APL result in differentiation of APL malignant promyelocytes into mature neutrophils, and you see that something called differentiation syndrome, uh, which clinically results in um, infiltration of maturing and differentiating uh, myeloid progenitors into the lungs and other organs, and this is called differentiation syndrome. Well, if you use one of these drugs in the clinic, we've seen that this can also lead to release in this block of differentiation and clinical differentiation syndrome. So that tells you that these drugs are hitting their target. And um, the first, probably the most advanced IDH inhibitor in the clinic is called AG221. Uh, and, and this is a slide from uh, patients with relapsed and refractory AML with IDH2 mutations. You can see it's, it has uh, resulted in some responses, including some complete responses that can be durable up to several months. So, so um, this has since moved on to phase two testing, and we're optimistic that it will move, um, move beyond that stage of development um, for a specific genetic subtype of AML. So in summary, um, though we've, we've known for decades that dis there are distinct patterns based on chromosomes. These have been described decades ago, but we could only use these when talking about prognosis. Um, nowadays, we're more and more using subchromosomal molecular genetic findings to guide not only prognostic discussions and therapeutic decisions, but also evaluating for the use of uh, novel therapies. And uh, we don't know this about patients' leukemia unless we ask at diagnosis. So it is really important to, to do the correct genetic test at diagnosis and to get as much information as possible to bring to bear the best therapies for, for patients and improve outcomes. Um, so I think that's all I have. And um, uh, I think we have a few minutes to open up the floor for questions from the science. We do. Uh, Dr. Foster, thank you so much. Let me remind uh, everyone of how they can go ahead and submit those questions. Uh, you can go ahead and either go to our pollab.com forward slash UNCCN and submit a question there. You're also welcome to just text it. Uh, if you haven't already, 22333, you're going to text UNCCN one time if you didn't do that at the beginning. And then after that, you can go ahead and text your questions. And uh, here we've got one already. Thank you. Does insurance uh, cover these tests typically? Yeah, that's an incredibly important question. And the answer to it is, is a little bit fluid, as is the whole insurance uh, uh, quilt work in our, our society. But um, so... Uh, Insurance, uh, obviously it varies according to policy. Insurance definitely covers cytogenetic testing, including fluorescence and situ hybridization. It definitely covers individual genetic tests. However, um, the technology is a little bit ahead of insurance in that the testing for multiple mutations at a time is done through something called next generation sequencing. It turns out if you want to know kind of what you know, the status of 10 genes, the cheapest and fastest way to do it is with next generation sequencing. But some insurance policies uh, do not cover that plat those type of platforms. But I think as the cost comes down mm -hmm. and some of the data gets more propagated, I think we'll see insurance um, uh, start to cover these. But I think it is an important question to address with, a, with the patient before mm -hmm. um, blanket ordering some of these. Sure. Are, are certain mutations more prevalent in certain age groups of adults? Um, that, that's definitely true. Mm -hmm. You see, um, we've known that from the cytogenetic profiling, the, the, the core binding factors, uh, abnormalities are more frequently seen in younger patients. And, uh, in fact, that's also true with some of the favorable prognostic mutations, like NPM1 is more frequently seen in younger patients. Okay. Um, um, is, is arsenic a current treatment for, for AML? So ar arsenic is a current treatment for APL, which yes, mm -hmm. is a subtype of AML. Okay. Um, it has been investigated in other types of AML, um, mm -hmm. and some of that investigation is still ongoing. So certain, certain molecular subtypes, potentially the NPM1 subtype, might benefit from arsenic, but it's not uh, quite ready for prime time yet. Okay. Is leukemia seasonal in declaration uh, in certain ages? Um, so I, I guess that question is referring to is there a seasonal um, uh, predilection for 
um, AML developing at certain times of the year. I don't. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware of that actually. Okay. And uh, what tools are needed next? Um, well, um, could talk about an hour about that. Question, <laughs> yeah. I think. So, so um, I think what is needed next really is for more and more patients to participate in clinical trials, so that some of the knowledge that we have about genetics and the knowledge about some of these newer uh, approaches uh, can be further studied and okay. benefit patients in the future. Great. Uh, are there hereditary genes that predict the occurrence of AML or mostly degenerative mutational changes? Um, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, very rarely is AML uh, inher heritable within families. There are mm -hmm. some. Uh, there are uh, some families with, for instance, RUNX1 mutations. We, s we showed the CEBP alpha mutations. There are some families who have who carry um, one mutated copy of CBP alpha. Mm -hmm. But that's the vast, vast minority of patients. And, and the majority of patients, we don't really know what risk factors, especially those who mm -hmm. haven't been exposed to DNA damaging agents. Mm -hmm. um, most patients, we don't know any risk factor when they develop AML other than advanced age. Okay. I was wondering, that was going to be one of my questions. We know that, that chemotherapy can increase risk. We know mm -hmm. age and, and the genetic screenings can give us information, but really nothing else beyond that that, yeah. would, that would be an indicator that yeah. somebody might be at higher risk. Certainly if you see it show mm -hmm. up in, in families, uh, in mm -hmm. multiple members of the families who developed AML at a young age, this, that's a little bit of a tip-off that, mm -hmm. that we need to look for a, a, a heritable cause. Right. Um, and, and that genotyping would go beyond just what we talked about in this lecture, okay. where we go, go into doing um, germline testing, like of a, of a cheek swab or a skin biopsy. All right. Okay. Well, we're, I really appreciate all the questions. Uh, that was great. Thank you so much for submitting those. Uh, just a few things as we wrap up. Uh, again, we're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. You can find us at UNCCN. Uh, dot org. So lots of places to find out about all of our lectures, uh, including to go visit the video lecture library where you can find uh, today's presentation and many others. And uh, we encourage you to share those with, with your colleagues. Uh, February 24th, this Friday, Community Lunch and Learn Lecture on Cancer, Stress Management for Everyday Living. Then on March 8th, we've got uh, RN and Allied Health Lecture Nutrition Update, Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery, and I should mention that in addition to the CNE and ASRT credit, this lecture will also offer a CPEU credit uh, from the Commission on Dietetic Registration. So if you know dietitians that uh, you would like to forward this information on to, we'd love to have them present, and they do have uh, that opportunity for continuing education credit. Then on March 22nd, Medical and Surgical Oncology Lecture, Promising New Treatment Options for Rectal Cancer. So uh, lots coming up, and we've got a whole year's worth of uh, presentations pretty much all fleshed out at uncn.org, so you can visit the events section to find out more about all of those. Uh, as always, we're uh, extremely indebted to the UCRF, the University Cancer Research Fund, and the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, and the North Carolina General Assembly for their generous support. Uh, additionally, I want to thank uh, Mary King and Alan Brown for their important roles in making all of this possible. Uh, that concludes our lecture for today. Dr. Foster, thank you again. This has been terrific. We really appreciate it.